Hey everybody, and welcome to your first uh, true e-learning day. Um, not the way that a lot of you guys would prefer to learn the material going forward, I'm sure. Um, but um, hopefully we'll still be fairly effective. Um, now, I do hope that everyone's staying half, uh, healthy and, and somewhat happy and, and not going too crazy um, being closed up in the house. Um, you know, in our crazy times right now, maybe some schoolwork would be a nice sidetrack. I uh, understand that there may be other stresses and other things going in your life, uh, going on in your life. Um, so hopefully, this would be a nice distraction uh, from some of that. Right? Um, don't want to throw too much at you uh, on the first day. So um, we are going to dive into two-dimensional area. Um, the rest of our semester, such as it will be. Um, Hopefully, we'll be able to make it back into the building fairly soon. Um, but if not, um, my anticipation is that we'll continue the rest of the semester in some form with e-learning days. And so um, we'll have to kind of get used to um, getting the information that we need about area from some video notes um, and then uh, set up some times and some ways for you guys to ask all the questions that you uh, may need to ask um, in terms of practicing um, this material in your homework. So um, everything's going to be a little bit unusual going forward, and that's okay. A little bit unusual for me as well, uh, including for this first video anyway, I forgot my stylus at school. So uh, I'm going to be writing with my finger, and hopefully that doesn't create too many problems um, as we go through the notes. Um, but anyway, uh, getting on with what we need to talk about in this uh, particular um, set of uh, video notes. Uh, we are getting into two-dimensional area and the rest of the semester we'll, we'll talk about area, surface area, and volume. A lot of things that you can really take with you um, when you leave uh, high school uh, and not just in terms of your next math class but uh, if you're ever a homeowner and a lot of you guys if not all of you guys will be you'll be using a lot of area, surface area, and volume. So any of this stuff you can take with you um, the easier owning that home might be. So um, for this set of uh, notes, we're going to get into just triangles and parallelograms. So um, kind of ease our way into it. This should be a lot of things that you've seen and, and done and heard already. Uh, just some nice review before we get into um, some uh, more in-depth area calculations um, and before we get into surface area and volume. So um, triangles and parallelograms. And so some vocabulary for you first. Now, when you talk about area, you're going to have to figure out almost, almost every uh, area formula has something to do with bases and heights. Um, we will get into diagonals a little bit with some of our shapes using diagonals to help us calculate area. But most of our shapes are going to require a height and a base, uh, a height of an object and a base length. Um, area is almost always sort of focused around those. So the sooner we understand that uh, the base of a subject, or sorry, the subject, the base of a shape, any shape, um, is going to be whatever the height is drawn to, right? So in a parallelogram, um, the bases are either set of the parallel sides, okay? We are going to measure the height of a parallelogram between either two sets of parallel sides. So whether we talk about um, these parallel sides being the bases, and obviously the yellow segment there being the height, the height is that distance between those two bases, or we can even turn this around and make these two guys the bases, right? And then have to measure the height um, between um, these guys, right? Uh, be a little bit more difficult to do so that red segment could somewhat be the height, right? But in a parallelogram, either sets of parallel sides are going to be your bases. Um, the height is going to be the shortest distance between the bases of that parallelogram. And what we talked about before with um, height is any sort of perpendicular distance uh, to what we're trying to measure. So this being our parallelogram, this being our parallelogram, the height of that guy is just how tall it is, right? The distance from, say, if this were the ground to the top of the parallelogram. Well, that 
that needs to be a perpendicular distance, right? Um, I've said many times before, you don't go to the doctor and lean to one side and have them measure the distance from the ground to your head that way, right? It's not at a perpendicular. Your height is always at a perpendicular and the height for any shape is the same. It needs to be some sort of distance that we're going to measure at a perpendicular to our bases, right? Um, so if that's a right angle, then you can imagine this guy up here is a right angle as well. And so that's going to be our height. So we're looking for at least one side to be a base and then the height to be drawn at a perpendicular to it is kind of what we're getting at here. Okay. And if we can um, sort of wrap our brain around that, then finding areas uh, becomes a bit easier. Okay. So before we extend uh, our conversation into all parallelograms and then the triangles and whatnot, there are a couple of postulates and theorems that we're going to want to review uh, that could, if we remember them and, and try to use them later, can make things a bit easier for us. And the first one is the area of a square, right? Um, we're going to get to area of a rectangle in just a minute. Um, hopefully you're going to remember that area is base times height. Um, but in a square, as you can imagine, um, the base and the height, right? So if you consider this your base, and then this guy, the height of the square, right? Because it's at a perpendicular, all of these angles are right angles. Then your base and your height end up being the same, the same length, because in a square, all the sides are the same length. So what this tells us is that uh, to find the area of the square, all you need is one side length, and then you can just square it. We can go just side times side. Instead of doing base times height, like for a rectangle, we can just do side times side because all those side lengths are going to be the same. Okay. Um, the next postulate um, centers around um, congruent polygons, right? And this is going to make a ton of sense. But if we can find the area of one polygon and then there's another polygon that's congruent to it, then they're going to have the same area. Well, no kidding, right? Um, for example, these two trapezoids, if they're congruent, they're gonna have the same area. That makes a lot of sense. They're gonna have the same base length, the same height, and so finding the area is gonna be the same. All right? So no big shocker there. Now, one thing that does become incredibly useful and I know it's not the first time you've seen it, but especially in terms of owning a home and trying to find areas sometimes, understanding that if we're trying to find the area of some region or the area of some weird blob shape that we don't have a formula for, we can always divide that shape up into parts, non-overlapping parts kind of being a crucial uh, thing here but divide it up into a bunch of non-overlapping parts, find the sum of each of those individual parts and add them together. Sorry, find the area of each of those individual parts and then add them together. So the area of a region is the sum of the areas of its non-overlapping parts, right? Um, and so if, you know, like I said, we get into something that looks kind of like this, um, we don't have a formula for like a puzzle piece. So if we can um, divide this up into, you know, a bunch of things, and this is not very straight, but divide them up into a bunch of rectangles or a combination of rectangles and triangles or whatever uh, shapes that we're going to eventually talk about area with, uh, then we can find the area of each individual piece and then add all those up to find the area of the whole thing. Makes a lot of sense, right? All right, so that being said, um, let's get into our areas of our shape. So square, we're just gonna take a side length and square it, no big deal. The area of a rectangle is, you remember being, of course, base times height, right? And so again, rectangle looks a lot like a square. And this is very quickly drawn, so please forgive me. Um, but base being here, height being here, because the sides are at a perpendicular. Um, and so we just take the base times its height, right? Um, well, 
as you can imagine, like maybe the wood flooring in your home, uh, a parallelogram is nothing more than a slanted rectangle, right? And so there's no reason to believe why the area just wouldn't be the same, right? If I took a rectangle and slanted it, I wouldn't lose or gain any area. It just looked different. Um, and so that formula is going to be the same. We're going to take the base length, find the height, or what's going to be the distance between the two bases. Remember, we're going to use the opposite parallel sides as, ba as bases and find the area that way. So, for example, these... Um, Paver, uh, paver bricks that you might use for a paver patio um, are parallelograms, right? And so to find the area, we just measure the base length and then the distance between a set of parallel sides, okay? Now, a triangle, uh, if you can kind of imagine it, we can always make a triangle, and I'll do this quickly, why the formula is the way it is, and I'll do this as much as I possibly can to make things make sense, right? But we can always turn a rectangle into a triangle and then ignore the other part. So what does that mean? That means if I find the area of a rectangle and then cut it in half, I'll have the area of a triangle. And so that's where the area of a triangle formula comes from. It's just one half base time side. Okay, so these are the uh, formulas that we're going to use going forward. All right, so uh, for example, Here's the parallelogram, and the thing with the parallelograms is that you have some options on how to approach this. Because like we defined a second ago, the bases of a parallelogram are going to be uh, either set of parallel opposite sides, right? So when we want to find the area of, say, this particular parallelogram, we know that we're going to use base times height, right? Well, in this parallelogram, which side is the base? Um, some of you may be thinking, well, the 12 is, right? Um, which is true. You can use the 12 there. So why don't we do that? If 12 is going to be the base length, then we need the height. And the height needs to be the distance measured between those two bases. And if you look, if, if PQ is going to be a base, then SR has to be the other one. And we need that distance between the two. That distance between the two is going to just be this guy right here. That's your perpendicular distance between those two bases, and so it's going to be 4. So we just take 12 times 4, which of course is 48, right? No problem. And some of you may be saying, hey, wait a minute, I didn't see it that way. Since PS is the guy that's on the ground, PS is the base. Okay, we can do that. Remember, we need a perpendicular distance between PS and QR, because that's the other base, right? And to measure the, or if you're going to look at it in terms of, um, you know, yes, PS is the base that's on the ground. Well, I got to know exactly how high off the ground the other side QR is, right? So in order to, to find the area, we are going to use this height that goes from the ground to, um, to the other base. And so eight ends up being that height. So we could just go six, which is the base length now, times eight, which is still gonna give us 48. It gives us the same thing. So it doesn't really matter. It's whichever sides that we can find the distance between. Okay, and that's what we're gonna use. Okay, um, all right, so you try it. Find the perimeter. Now this asks you to find the perimeter as well. Remember the perimeter is just out of all the sides. So um, quickly, um, fit, you know, remember, try to bring back what you remember about a parallelogram, find the perimeter, and then find the area of this guy. Okay, I'll give you a couple of seconds. You can stop the video, um, work this out, and then go ahead and start it back up and see if what you've done is correct. Okay, first and foremost for the perimeter, right? For the perimeter, we're going to add up all the sides. Well, so far we have a side that's 20 and a side that's 30, so we can add those guys up. But remember in a parallelogram, the opposite sides are also congruent, not just parallel. So that means that that guy is going to be 30 and this guy is going to be 20. So we need to add another 30 and another 20. So 30 plus 30 is 60, plus 20 is 80, plus 20 is 100. So this is, uh, the perimeter is just going to be 100 
um, units. We don't have units, but remember that prim perimeter is a linear unit. So it's just gonna be whatever units we're gonna use. Now, area we just used is base times height. 17 is the only distance that we've been given between sides. So 17 becomes the height of our parallelogram. So that means since that segment that is drawn, that is 17, is drawn perpendicular to the 30 side, that needs to become our base. So 30 times 17. Multiply this out, and we get 510. And now we don't have units, but um, for area, let me write that a little bit better. For area, the units are always squared because we're multiplying two measurements together. Okay? All right. Uh, and so you have the answers there. Next, find the perimeter in the area of the, this polygon. Okay, a couple of ways you can approach this. I'll give you a couple of seconds to, to give it your, your best shot. And then again, you can start the video up and I'll walk through uh, a couple of different ways you can do this. Okay. So um, first thing, perimeter, pretty easy. Just add up all the sides. We've got a 17, a 10, and a 21 because this whole thing is which is one shape, right? So we go, what, 27 and then 48 units. Okay, now area. Now this, it just says polygon. I mean, obviously it's a triangle, right? Now you can look at this picture in one of two different ways. You can look at this as one giant triangle, right? Or you can see this as two right triangles, right here and right here. And from that uh, theorem that we talked about a second ago, we can always find the area of each right triangle and then add those two areas together to get uh, the area of our entire shape. But since this is a triangle, we do have a formula for triangle, one half base times height, right? And so what we got to do now is figure out what is the base length and what are we going to use for the height? Well, this segment right here that's been measured at eight is perpendicular to a side. It goes to a vertex and is perpendicular to a side. It's also known as an altitude, right? Um, and so altitudes can be used as heights in a triangle. But if we're going to use 8 as our height, then 21 has to be our base, right? So now we just go 1 half times 21 times 8. Half of 8 is 4. We can multiply this in any order that we want. So we go 4 times 21, and then we get 84 units squared. Now, if we wanted to look at these as two right triangles, which we certainly can, then it's interesting if you look at this right triangle, okay, um, well, we're going to run into a little bit of a problem trying to do it this way, but I'll talk about it anyway. That right triangle, we're still going to use one half base times height. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. We're still going to use one half base times height. Now, in a right triangle, you've got two sides that are perpendicular to each other. And so those two sides, the legs, are going to be what you use for the height and the base. And in the end, it doesn't matter which, you, which one you use for, for what, right? So I'm going to have to stop because um, I don't know what the length of that base is. Right? If I use 8 as the height, I don't know what the length of that base is. Now, I could probably figure it out because we can just do Pythagorean theorem here to find that piece and then subtract 21, subtract that from 21 and find this other piece. But it's more work than I want to get into right now. But that's something that we could do later on in other problems. Okay? Um, but for right now, if you look at that as just one giant triangle, life gets it to be a bit easier. All right? All right. Um, so next example here, um, we can use the idea of area to not just find an area, but also 
help us figure out relationships between side lengths um, or relationship between measurements if you want, if you have an area in mind. So for example, maybe you need a, a right triangle to cover an area of 36 square inches, right? I mean, this is interior design stuff. It's architecture stuff. It's um, some, definitely some, some, way, some reasons why you might want to know that. So if that's the case, here we want the area of that triangle to be 36 square inches, and we want the base to be twice as, length as, the, uh, twice as long as the height, right? So if that's the case, we don't know the length or the height, we would want to give the vari a variable to one of them. Since the base is twice as long as the height, it makes sense to just use, um, just use a variable for the height, so call it h. If the height is h, then the base has to be twice that um, length, so it's going to be 2h, right? And so we've been given the area. So if we use the area formula, it's going to have us use, uh, taking one half times the base, which we've now written as 2h, times the height, which we've now written as h. But we know what that area is. It's 36 square inches. So we just plug 36 in for that a. a just becomes another variable. Right, and now we have an equation that we need to solve for h. So to simplify the right side, we gotta take half of two. Half of two is just one. So we get h times h, which is h squared. And then to find h, we just square root both sides. And so we normally would get plus or minus six in our algebra class, right? But since um, h is an actual height of a triangle, we can't use the negative side of that. So um, the height has to be six. And we do have actual units here. Our area was given to us in square inches. That means that our height must be in inches. So this is gonna be six inches. And then our base is just gonna be two times the height which is going to be 2 times 6, which is obviously going to be 12 inches. Okay? So if we make a right triangle where the base is 12 inches, the height is 6 inches, then we'll get a right triangle that covers 36 square inches. Okay? So just some way to back into some uh, dimensions of a shape if we need to. All right? Um, all right, and then just a couple more things to kind of get you going. Um, here we've got a barn, right? And we need to paint our barn. Uh, we know that a, a gallon of paint will cover 350 square feet if you apply it the right way, right? Uh, now what's the right way? That differs from person to person. But anyway, basically a gallon of paint covers 350 square feet. So how many gallons do you need to paint just that face, that side of that barn, right? Well, the whole barn itself, if you consider the whole barn itself, is a pentagon. And we don't know how to find the area of a pentagon just yet. So really what we need to do, so really what we need to do is break this up into two shapes. And you can see that it's been done here already. We do have a rectangle here. And then we do have a right triangle here. Right? It's a right triangle because there's a right angle right there. And interesting that in that right triangle, the two legs are the same length. That's interesting. All right, so again, since I don't have a formula for a pentagon to find the area of a pentagon, I need to piece this area together. So first, the area of the rectangle right, is just very easy. It's base times height. The base we can use is 26 feet, the height 18 feet. And then we simply multiply those two things together. Let me grab my calculator. I don't want to think that hard about this. And so we get 468 um, square feet. That's for the rectangle. Now we've got to find the area of that triangle. And to find the area of that triangle, we need 
one half base times height. Well, it's a right triangle, and I said before, you can use the legs as the base and the height. Well, we don't know the length of the legs, but they're the same, right? So we could let this be x and this be x because they're going to be the same and then use Pythagorean theorem. So leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared where 26 is the hypotenuse, right? And so now we get 2x squared equals 676. Divide that by 2 and now x squared is equal to 338. Now we square root both sides, and I'm going to leave it as the square root of 38. You're going to see why in a second. So that means I take 1 half times the square root of 338, which is one of the legs, for the base, and then the other leg for the height. So we're going to do the square root of 338 again, all the while remembering that if I take two radicals that are exactly the same and I multiply them together. It's the same as squaring those two, squaring that radical, or if you want to, just take 338 times 338 and then square root it, and you're gonna find that this is actually still just 338 without the radical now. And now divide 1 half into 338, and we get 169 square feet, okay? So like I said, up here, if that was a little bit too quick and not enough work shown, just go ahead and take 338 times 338 and leave that inside the radical, right? And you get 114,244, and then square root that, and you'll get 338 right over here. And then you take half of 338, okay? Now, the total area, we have to take the 468, plus the 169. And our total area is going to be 637 square feet. Okay, now, a gallon of paint will cover 350 square feet. So how many gallons do we need? Well, we need to know how many times 350 will go into 637, right? Um, so we got to take 350 and divide it into 637. And when we do, we're looking at 1.82. Obviously, you can't buy two, uh, 0.8 gallons of paint, so you need to go to the store and buy two gallons, and that should help you paint that side of the barn, which is useful. I mean, you'd rather just make one trip to the paint store, not two. Uh, two. Right? So knowing how many gallons you need would be great. And you don't want to have like three extra gallons of paint. You're never going to use it. So it just becomes wasteful. Okay? So there you go. A use that you might use. Now, you may not have a barn, but you'll have walls in your house. So um, keep that in mind as well. Okay? Now, a couple of additional problems here that are not in your notes. So uh, if you're in Notability taking these notes, then uh, just kind of go down to the... the um, blank page below and uh, try to work this out, right? A robotic vacuum cleaner can clean two square meters of carpet in eight minutes. About how long does it take for it to clean the carpet covering a room with the dimensions to the right, right? So take a couple of minutes, stop the video, try to work it out on your own, and then bring it back up and I'll show you how I did it. All right, so did you get about four hours, right? How did I come up with that? Well, this L shape, uh, I just broke up into two, well, a rectangle and a square, really. So I divided, um, I took a segment and just drew it across there. And so I created my rectangle at the top, rectangle with a base of nine. And um, I had to find the dimensions of everything, right? Well, if this length is five and this whole length is nine, that means that this length has to be four. Um, this length over here is five, so that means that this needs to be five if I draw that line straight across. So I've created a square at the bottom, and the area of a square is just side squared, right? Or take five times five to get 25. So the bottom square area is 25. The top rectangle, we've got a base of nine and a height of four. 
And so you can see there inside the rectangle that we just did nine times four is 36. So now to find the total area, I gotta take 36 plus 25 and it gives me 61 square meters. Now to find the time it would take for that robotic cleaner to clean it, I actually use a proportion, right? I went back all the way back to our proportion days last semester where it says, well, if the cleaner can go two square meters in eight minutes, I can compare two square meters to eight minutes. And that, ha th that sort of relationship has to be the same even if the, car the cleaner is going to clean 61 square meters. So two square meters to eight minutes needs to be equal to 61 square meters to however long it's going to take for the robot to clean it. So that's going to be my x. Then we cross multiply, we get 2x equals 488, then divide, we get 244. So it's going to take the robot 244 minutes, divide that by 60, and you get about four hours. So now the robot's going to take about four hours. Okay? Uh, again, useful information if you know how long the battery will last in a robot cleaner. Um, in, this, in a particular model, then maybe if that's not enough, then we got to go looking for another model or just know that we have to charge it a couple of times and clean it, right? So anyway, um, home ownership. You got to look forward to it, right? All right. Um, and so that's it. Um, we'll stop there. Uh, you have a homework assignment in Canvas. Go ahead and give it your best shot. Uh, and if we need to use another e-learning day, um, we'll find a way to answer questions uh, over that homework uh, for next time, right? Uh, but until then, uh, we'll see you then. Hopefully we'll see you soon in the, in the school building. Take care.